Hey guys, here's my latest eBay purchase. Big box, but doesn't weigh much. So, might as well tell you right now, it is not too based. It is solid state, I'm sorry to say, but I think it will be a very useful addition to my workshop. Looks like they put it in a big box, put it in a sea of foam peanuts, and wrap the item itself in some plastic bubble wrap. No, it was already damaged. That was clearly stated in the eBay listing, so I'm already braced for that, but I think mm -hmm. it is still operational. And what it is, is a liter RF generator. Uh, good for up to 450 megahertz, I believe. Now, sure, I've already got several RF generators. I got the W, or sorry, the RCA uh, WR50 up there, and the Heathkit IG102, and both work okay, uh, but it is nice to have a more modern, more accurate RF generator, especially after my experiences with this more modern wave tech stuff and how well it worked when doing alignments. Um, but I think this will be a uh, nice addition. The only reason I wanted to get it is that um, I've got some upcoming alignments like on this Motorola here where I'm going to really need some multiple markers, multiple variable markers. And I'm going to need at least two or three RF generators to make all those markers. So I probably will be using this in conjunction with something like this. Uh, so I'm going to unwrap this and do a visual inspection. And uh, let's hope that it actually does work. So here it is. It's a liter 17A. It goes from 100 kilohertz all the way up to 150 megahertz direct and up to 450 megahertz on harmonics. That's over three bands. Now here's the physical damage. A crack on the frame here that's no big deal I can just glue that and it's missing a little bit of the corner here even after it's would be glued but that's no big deal and it's flopping around it's missing a foot well I got plenty of spare feet got a couple right here uh, these are a little bit taller so I might just replace all four because I got a whole bunch of these so if that's all that is wrong with it uh, this damage here in that foot. Uh, I'm not going to complain. I got a pretty good price on it. Only weighs, I'd say, about three pounds, and it's fairly small. And that's the main reason I wanted it. As you can see, my uh, my shelves here are crammed with test equipment. So not only do I not have a whole lot of room left, but I'm always worried about the sheer weight on these shelves just ripping these out of the walls and all this stuff could come tumbling down. Let's see here, tuning action. It's a little stiff, clearly the uh, oh I can see, yeah the uh, the clear plastic here has gotten mushed in so I gotta pop that back out and that'll free up that needle. The switch seems fine, that's okay. Band switch is fine. One thing I found curious about this is that the output is these banana jacks. I'm so used to high frequency equipment all using BNCs or these older style connectors. But nothing I've got uses banana jacks for high frequency. So I'm a little curious how well this works when you get up into the tens and hundreds of megahertz to have this. I also got to look up to see what kind of... Uh, termination or cable this should use. I don't know if it's 50 ohms or 75 or whatnot. You can also insert a crystal and when you put it in this position it'll oscillate at that frequency which is a handy feature. I've got a number of crystals that will fit into the socket like 10.7 to use as a marker for FM radio alignment. 1 kilohertz internal AM modulation or external modulation here. Yeah, that's about it. Doesn't look like it's fused, at least not with an external fuse. 
So we just put a Velcro connector on the back here for the power cord. So I think what I better do first is open this up, free up the pointer on the front there by popping that clear plastic out, and check for any physical or electrical damage before trying to power this up. Here it is on the inside. It's actually not all that different from its tube equivalent. If I pop open this Heath kit or RCA, you'll see something very similar in terms of a band switch and a bunch of inductors around a multi-position rotary switch. Of course, the big difference here is these solid state components over here. Leading in solid state power supply. Nothing looks to be fried that I can see. Here's where the damage is on the inside. So this whole plastic frame is held onto the metal frame by these Phillips screws here. Of course, this side broke out. And this side's still attached. So I'm going to remove these screws, which should take this plastic off, and then I can free up this mushed in uh, clear plastic. And uh, I think I will try powering it up. I'm very happy to say that it seems to be working just fine. For example, right now I've got it on the C band, which is 1 to 3.5 megahertz, which is this guy here. So let's dial this into 2. And here it is on my scope frequency right about two megahertz a little bit of noise that's the only downside I've seen but I think part of that might just be that these banana jacks are not uh, anywhere near as shielded like I said earlier or something like this I'm also not sure what the uh, termination resistance should be on this or what the uh, output impedance should be which might uh, knock out some of that noise if I uh, put the right load on it uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, output attenuation seems to work just fine. Internal modulation seems to work just fine. Should be one kilohertz. So if I go down in frequency, uh, there's the AM modulation. And if I go down to, let's say, the next band down, which is three. Or 0.3 megahertz to 1 megahertz. B band, and now let's put it on, say, 500. And let's check this guy. Right about 500. I noticed the lower frequency is a sine wave gets a little bit lumpy. Here's the lowest frequency range of all. But still not too bad. And, uh, let's see, I've not tried the higher ranges yet. This is 10 to 35 here. Let's put this on 30 megahertz. And let's check it out here. Not bad, not bad at all. And let's go here. And let's put them right at 100. Now, my, this is only a 100 megahertz scope. Uh, so this is kind of approaching its range of... Um, uh, its bandwidth range, but uh, still getting 100 megahertz. Or thereabouts. As you notice, the noise and the signal causes the trigger in my scope to jump around a little bit which is why the frequency uh, readings jump around a little bit too. So if I could get rid of that noise, filter it out, uh, this would lock in better and I could get a more accurate reading of what this frequency actually is, but clearly it's pretty darn close to 100 megahertz. In other words, uh, I know my scope is calibrated pretty accurately, so that means this dial is pretty darn uh, accurate too. And finally, the harmonic range. Oh, <laughs> I see. There is no harmonic range. 
Uh, what this means is that that little bit of noise I was just complaining about is actually the higher harmonics. So if I was to say put this on oh here 100 megahertz and had a filter that would filter like a bandpass on 300 megahertz some of this signal should have a 300 megahertz component to it but I don't have such a device for right now and my scope couldn't see it anyways so uh, I'll just leave it at this so yeah this seems to be working uh, quite quite nicely and I'm just changing the frequency on the dial and it's moving in like stuff Amplitude changes a little bit, but uh, that's not. of course part of that too is I'm on the highest range and my scope's bandwidth will be affected by that, so let's drop this down a little bit and try that again. Eh, not too bad. That's something uh, I've commonly seen on lower end signal generators is that as you sweep the frequency or dial it in from one end of the range to the other the uh, amplitude will vary a bit but uh, that's not too bad so yeah uh, overall I gotta say this was a pretty darn good purchase I'll uh, get out my plastic epoxy glue and try to fix this up as best I can and clean it up a bit get this crap off and so on and I think this will be a very nice addition to my workbench now one last thing I want to show you guys is I mentioned I had some older scopes out on the back porch that I want to get rid of and there was a couple or sorry there were a couple requests to see them so I'm going to pull them out and hook them up to this and show you uh, how they work. They are older scopes they are I believe part two part transistor um, but uh, as far as I know they still work just fine so we'll see how they compare to this more modern scope. Here are those two vintage scopes I was referring to. This one is labeled a Kakusi, and this one says Data Instruments, but I believe it's just a rebranded Kakusi. It's on model 555G, and this is a 555-N. I'm not sure what the difference is. I think it's fairly subtle, whatever it might be. This one works fine. This one has an issue where the trace fades as the scope warms up. It probably needs some new capacitors. So here it is going to the RF generator. These have PL259 jacks. I've got a PL259 to BNC adapter here and I've connected my uh, modern scope probe to it. So here it is going to the RF generator. Varying the frequency on it. And there's a varying amplitude. Here it is with the AM modulation turned on. These have a bandwidth of about 15 megahertz. There's a trigger control here right now. It's on positive, so it triggers on the rising edge of the sine wave. If I go negative, it triggers on the falling edge. And like I said, this one uh, works just fine. I'll pop these open and show you what's inside. As memory serves, these are hybrid. It's transistors uh, in the mid part. I think there's a vacuum tube on the front end and a vacuum tube to drive the actual deflection plates in the CRT. I popped the cover off the scope that has a trouble with the trace fading as it warms up. Now we can take a better look at what's inside. And as I thought, it has three tubes and the rest is transistorized. There's a 12 AU7 that acts as a high impedance buffer on the input. And there are two Output tubes here to drive the deflection plates. Six DJ8s. Quite easy to work on as scopes go for sure. Several boards. Got one main board down here, one up on the side, and one on the back. Everything's clearly labeled. For example, that's a 2SC372 transistor, 22K resistor, and so on. And you can even work on them while they're in the scope pretty easily because the whole bottom is open. You can heat up um, the pads here to replace parts if needed. And uh, yeah, boy, everything's even better labeled than I realized. So they even have 
etched into the circuit board, this should be plus 50 volts, plus 15, minus 50, high voltage, and so on, and what the various adjustments are for. I also went online to the Kakusi website, and uh, you can actually download the uh, user's manual for free. It does not have the service info, it does not have the schematic, but it does have instructions on uh, what all these controls do and so on. The oil, oil filled rather high voltage capacitors that filter the uh, high potential for the pitcher, or sorry, for the cathode ray tube. It's probably around a thousand volts or so. High quality caps, too. I think these are polystyrene caps. Kind of hard to find these days, but they're known for being especially low noise. I've seen them used in high quality vintage. Um, Stereo receivers and amplifiers. So uh, while I got this out, I'm going to take a, a token effort to see what the problem might be. Certainly I'll check the tubes because that's easy enough. I tested all three tubes and they're just fine. I then did a visual inspection and didn't find any broken connections or capacitors that were oozing their electrolyte or anything like that. So I'm not quite sure what the problem is. Probably some bad leaky capacitors though. That's usually what the problem is in this old vintage stuff. So what this problem actually manifests as, I've had the scope turned on for a while, it's warmed up, there's no trace. There's nothing you can do with any of the controls, position, trigger, and so on to get a trace on there. However, when you turn it off, the green blob will appear over here somewhere. There it is. So the CRT has some life left. Uh, it's just not getting a signal to it. So I'm not sure what the problem is. Probably not too hard to figure out though, especially if you compare it to the other scope, which is working fine. So if anybody is interested in these, um, let me know. I'm willing to let them go pretty cheap. Uh, shipping, I suppose it's possible, although a little impractical. These probably weigh 15, 20 pounds each. But uh, if nobody wants them, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to scrap them one of these days. I just don't have the room to keep everything. I also plan on selling off some of my restored test equipment. I'll do a dedicated video, but briefly I think I'll get rid of my ICO 315 RF generator, a Hewlett Packard frequency counter, one or two of my VTVMs, and maybe one or two sleep generators, and so on. Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed a look at uh, some vintage Kakusi 555 scopes and a liter 17A RF generator. I was able to glue the uh, faceplate up more or less and got this piece that had been bashed in, unbashed, so it's turning freely now. Could not find a liter 17A manual online. However, I got a tip that the B and K 2005B is virtually identical, and that manual is available freely online, so I downloaded it. It doesn't have a schematic, but it does explain how all the controls work. And uh, I tried to find the output impedance, and there wasn't any stated, so I don't think it's uh, calibrated to have a fixed out in output impedance like 50 ohms or 75 ohms. So I guess you just connect up some... Uh, test probes to it, hook it up to your uh, circuit, and don't worry too much about terminating it with the correct impedance. That's all for now.